These events are also free to attend regardless of whether you're a member, and that is because of the generosity of sponsors who from the very beginning have made it possible for us to do these events. They have nothing to do with the program, they have nothing to do with the choice of guests or with the questions, but they have everything to do with the mission of the Tribune. They believe, as we do, that educating the public about the issues that we all face in this state matters. And who could disagree with that? We, uh, we want to thank the sponsors of today's event, specifically Centerpoint Energy, Accenture, Texas Gas Service, and Ryan, as well as the series sponsors of the Texas Tribune's events here at the Austin Club and elsewhere, AT&T, BP, PepsiCo, Walmart, and Southwest Airlines. Please join me in giving them a big hand for making it possible for you to be here and for us to be here. I want to say one quick word about the Texas Tribune Festival. That is really the only thing that's on the lineup right now. September 23rd, 4th, and 5th, Commissioner Sitton has uh, generously agreed to be part of a lineup that will be, in the end, 250 speakers. We're expecting perhaps 4,000 people to attend our sixth annual three-day Ideas Festival. Yesterday, we announced a list of new people who confirmed to speak. They include Governor John Hickenlooper of Colorado, the new Health and Human Services Commission, Executive Commissioner Charles Smith, former Congressman Tom DeLay, current Congressman Gene Green, former Controller Susan Combs, the head of MD Anderson, the Episcopal Bishop of Texas. It's a wide-ranging group of folks. Um, we're now up to about 180 confirmed speakers. TexasTribune.org slash festival. If you're not already signed up, we'd love to have you come and be part of that event. Now it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's guest, Ryan Sitton, one of three commissioners serving on the Texas Railroad Commission, the state's energy regulator and its oldest regulatory agency. He was elected to that post in 2014, prevailing in the general election against nominal Democratic opposition after handily winning a contentious Republican runoff against former State Representative Wayne Christian, who after the 2016 election cycle is all but certain to be Commissioner Sitton's fellow commissioner. This is where we insert a gif of a 15-year-old girl rolling her eyes and going, awkward. Uh, this is Mr. Sitton's first elective office, though he previously ran unsuccessfully for the state house. A 20-year veteran of the oil, gas, and petrochemical industry, he is the founder with his wife of Pinnacle Advanced Reliability Technologies and Energy and Tech Company. Born and raised in Irving, he has an undergraduate degree from Texas A&M University. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Ryan Sitton. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. I was worried there at the end of the introduction I was going to say Trump University rather than Texas A&M <laughs> University. I wouldn't have whooped if you'd have done that. You would not have whooped. Well, we'll get to Trump in, in a bit. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I did what I do every day as a good Texan. I got up this morning and the first thing I did was look at the price of oil. We're just below $50. Mm -hmm. That is almost double where we were as we sat on this stage with another guest, very possibly the controller in January, we were a little bit more concerned about where this was headed. So we're double where we were in January, but we're 15 bucks below where we were a year ago, and we are half the price of where we were two years ago. Mm -hmm. Discuss. Tell me how we should think about this from your perspective, both as a regulator and as somebody who's been in this business. Wow. And how long do we have? Okay. <laughs> if your answers are going to be this long, you and I are not going to have a good time today. So. So no, you I, said I, as, a, as a regulator and... And as somebody who has been an operator, or somebody who's been in the, in the oil and gas business, right? You, you have a perspective of, from both sides. So how should we think about the price of oil? Well, let me, let me in fact, add to this to give a little more context yeah. to the folks listening. Not only have I, have I been in the business, I've been all over the world. I've been in Kuwait and Saudi right. Arabia, Malaysia, Australia, North America, South America, Canada, uh, UK, everywhere. We have some pretty special opportunities in Texas today, not just because, yes, our oil and gas business is resurging, but because of the nature of technology, the demand for energy across yeah. the world growing, and the ability to put that technology into the field and develop oil resources in months versus years, yeah. like it took a few years ago, uh, the opportunities in Texas are, are quite substantial. So when, it, when you ask me, well, today we're at $50, what does this mean for us? I say, yeah, in the short term, it's really, it's painful. And you'll see a lot of our reserves, particularly in, in South Texas, like the Eagleford and East yeah. Texas, where $50 oil is tough to make cash flow. Uh, there's still places like the Permian Basin where at $50, you can uh, make some money. And there are still wells being drilled. But when you look across the globe, yeah. at 93 million barrels a day being used, Roughly two-thirds of those are positive cash flow at $50 a barrel. So what that tells us is the long-term fundamentals absolutely 
will increase and push up the price. So you, you said it's resurging was the word I think you mm -hmm. used. You're, you're optimistic that we've seen the worst of this and that the only place we're going to go from here is, is up. Uh, I will say this. I do believe that next year prices are going to be higher than they are this year. Right. I don't claim to be, uh, yeah. to be some sort of Sengali that, that everybody else tries to be. I don't know if oil prices may in the short run fluctuate downward or upward a little right. bit more, but you ask me in the next five years, prices are absolutely you're, going you're, to You're up. optimistic. Is, did the Railroad Commission's hands be on this? I'm trying to understand what role, if any, the Railroad Commission feels like it or the commissioners you specifically feel like you should play in trying to impact this. Because, you know, I understand that you come... You are a proud member of a party that believes in limited government and sure. limited regulation. So on the one hand, you'd say, well, the obvious answer is railroad commission shouldn't do anything about this because we believe in free markets. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you understand that it is the public's benefit or the public's detriment if this goes in the wrong direction. And the question is, where do you think the Railroad Commission should put itself into this conversation? Well, realize that the legislature in 1919 granted the Railroad Commission specifically yeah. the power to set allowable levels or proration levels across the state. Yeah. So today, I and another commissioner could decide to set proration levels and increase the price of oil. The problem is if I increase it for the state of Texas, yeah. by decreasing our production, I also increase it for everybody else in the world. Yeah. So while in the short term that may feel good, yeah. in the long run it's better for us to st simply compete, allow other people's production right. to come off the market. Do you worry about the degree to which we've lost jobs in the energy sector? You know, there's different pr perspectives on this. There's people who have their, you know, kind of pulling their hair out of their head in Houston, oh, you know, whether it's Schlumberger or Baker Hughes laid off this many or that many. But then you hear people, I think my colleague Jim Malowitz wrote a story recently about how things in Midland were not nearly as bad as everybody thought they were sure. going to be. We seem to have insulated ourselves to some degree, and again, the controller as a reference point here told me, well, it was 22 percent of the economy was reliant on oil and gas the last time everything kind of went into the drink. This time it's more like 14 percent. It's just not nearly as much of an impact on us. I just wonder if, that, if the larger economic implications give, put you in any frame of mind about, about Well, first of all, you asked, do I, does it all concern about job losses yeah. in the industry? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that always concerns me when you're seeing large-scale right. job losses. Uh, I think your question is more to the broad, is this yeah. going to have substantial economic impacts on Texas? Uh, if prices come back next year, I think right. that in general you'll see Texas economy continue to grow. Right. If it were to sustain for a longer period of time, which I don't think it's going to do, then it could have. Yeah, so you see, you see there, are, there are potentially, but not certainly, more, more not in this downside, economic so. problems on the horizon. Back to this question of the Railroad Commission's role as a regulator. I've characterized your point of view on regulation correctly. You believe less regulation is better. No. 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 You're pro-regulation. We may have made news. Uh, <laughs> Look, you can't, the, the, the sort of very simplistic statement, less regulation is better, is, right. is not. Won't be the first time I've been simplistic. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Look, you asked me, what is the job of the Railroad Commission today? Right. It is to make sure that the people of this state have confidence in how the energy industry is doing business in this state. Right. You ask, who does that benefit? that benefits all 27 million Texans right. and every good operator in the state of Texas. Do you think the industry would say that when the Railroad Commission regulates on behalf of the 27 million people that that's good for the industry? This is always the tension point, Commissioner, you know that. Who do you work for? The, the knock on the Railroad Commission is, well, they're way too close to industry. They're basically, uh, they're not the watchdog that they ought to be. They're not the protector of the public. They're kind of like the industry's chew toy. <laughs> you seem to be pushing back on that idea and suggesting that you're not beholden to them you're accountable to us, and therefore regulating is a good thing for the state of Texas. Absolutely. A little bit of a different point of view than I would expect to hear. You know, it's funny. I, I think that's because there is it's such an easy dynamic. Uh, you know, I think it was, in fact, it might have been Ross Ramsey one time who said on one of your tripcasts that uh, the media are professional fight promoters. And yep. so we look for the opportunity to drive, oh, well, is there right. this big conflict of interest? I don't think it's, frankly, nearly that romantic. So, yeah, so we're along the, I understand there's a continuum of regulation or a continuum along which the, the commission could decide to place itself in terms of how closely it keeps an eye on industry. Mm -hmm. Help me understand where you view the industry's responsibility. Well, it's, it's very simple. If the people of the state are not confident, if they're yeah. saying to themselves, you know, I, I don't know if this is okay. Yeah. I, I, there might be problems out there, then we need to do more either yeah. to improve our rules, to educate the public, yeah. or on enforcement. Those are the three areas that we operate. Yeah. And you ask me, who are the first people to come and tell us that? It is industry. Mm -hmm. They're the first people to come and say, uh, Ryan, if there are bad performers, it is your job to take them out because right. it makes it hard on the rest of us to do business. Yeah. You, you, you've heard this knock on, oh, sure. on, on the commission that you guys are, are, are too soft. Uh, we, we had promoted this event people were aware that I was going to sit down with you. I had several people come to me 
and say, ask him about this case that's in the air right now in Palo Pinto County. A family in 2014 had a, a water well that blew up. There had been some concern that oil and gas activity had contaminated their well, and there was a sense that the Railroad Commission, either in the course of this or after it, either hadn't sufficiently or aggressively investigated these concerns enough or has basically blown the investigation since. The implication of that, it's explicit actually, is the Railroad Commission is more concerned about industry than it is about individual people in the community, and so they've basically gone soft on these allegations that there was something wrong that we should have known about. And the result was, I think the water well blew up, family of four was severely burned. Big story this week about it. We wrote about it some time ago. Do you know about this case specifically? I know about this case. Yeah. Uh, the Railroad Commission is investigating, investigating this case right now, right. so I can't comment on it specifically. But let me speak generally about these issues. Yeah. And let me give you a very specific example. Uh, you know, everyone is talking in the state about seismicity a lot. Right, right well, I was going to come there in a second, so good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when we had, there, there was a, this is probably oh, six, seven, eight months ago, we had a 4.0 magnitude event that was up in the Mansfield Venus area. Right. Um, that happened on a Thursday. I got in the car and drove up there so that I could be on the ground Friday morning to go personally put my hands on these wells. I mean, we take this exceptionally seriously because, once again, you think you, if industry is out there saying no one is going to let us. does, but I also don't know that it doesn't. And the, the sense is that the Railroad Commission's response to this has been slow at best or to, as a matter of course, rebut this and say, we don't believe that, that this is the case. You're saying, you're suggesting a totally different perspective on it. Well, yeah, once again, I can only speak to the perspective. If you ask about what the job we're doing at the Commission, yeah. I can speak to the things that I know we are doing and right. the things I personally am doing. Now, you asked me about perception. Well, yeah, I get that there are negative perceptions. Let's right. face it, it's the, the nature of politics is in general politicians aren't, aren't hugely popular. You're, you're, you're willing to sit here and say in front of an audience and in front of a camera that you are prepared, you're prepared to say that you believe that all types of injection to yeah. demonstrate that anthropogenic seismicity is, is possible. The question is, are, is the commission able to say, oh yes, absolutely, we agree with a certain study? No, we right. haven't said that. And look, I have personally not just read the studies, I've engaged the people doing the studies, yeah. I've reviewed the peer reviews, and yeah, I, I think, wait a minute, there's some huge questions about assumptions that were made, about the subjectivity and qualitative nature of these studies. Peace. So, there's a big difference between saying, yeah, and let's face it, we wouldn't have put, and I say we, the legislature, to give them credit, wouldn't have put $5 million towards additional seismic monitoring and additional seismic study using some of the same right. people that I engaged to review the SMU study if we didn't think it was possible. Well, in fact, you now have the agency, in fairness to the agency, the agency's hired a seismologist. Absolutely. Right? You have now uh, uh, required that more information be shared when disposal wells are drilled. I guess I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, that socialist outpost of Oklahoma has now come back around and said, we believe that there may be a connection between oil and gas activity and seismicity. It just feels like Texas has not been as out, as out there and saying, yes, we consider the possibility, take this seriously, and feel like we have work to do. But you, you're well, let me respectfully speak disagreeing with me about that. Yeah. No, no yeah. let's speak to that specifically. Yeah. Compare Oklahoma and Texas. In, Oklahoma, in, in Texas, a big disposal well is 25,000 barrels a day. In Oklahoma, yeah. it's 250,000 barrels a day. Right. In Texas, our seismic events have gone up by a factor of 10. In yeah. Oklahoma, they've gone up by a factor of 600. Yeah. So you can't assume, well, the guys in Oklahoma said it is. It's obviously in Texas. Yeah. That would be poor science. It's not, not the same thing. Right. Right. Uh, let me ask you about regulation from the perspective of the feds. Okay. Uh, uh, I know that, again, even if we accept the fact that it is partly the Railroad Commission's responsibility to regulate responsibly on behalf of industry and on behalf of the public, the feds would say, 
Well, we believe that there is regulation at the federal level that we need to kind of convey down to the states or, or things, policies of the federal government that we want the states to follow. The state has seemed to have a, a problem with, uh, with the federal government sticking its nose in our, our business. Fair characterization? Well, especially when that nose is not based on good science or good research. Yeah. It's based on a political agenda. And, and let's even use, look, there are, there are certainly good examples of good regulation and examples yeah. of bad regulation. Mm -hmm. And even if, and let, let's pick on one or two, the Clean Power Plan, which has gotten a lot of sure. press. If you go back to 1975 when, the, when Congress passed the CAFE standards, right? They had broad sweeping support amongst the American people to increase the required fuel economy in every vehicle. Yeah. But they don't enforce that. They turn to the Department of Transportation to do the enforcement. We have been looking, and EPA and, and several of the, of the folks in Washington as a group have been looking for Congress to make a move. They haven't done it. So the yep. EPA unilaterally sets policy and then enforces it. Regardless of what you think about the discussion on climate change, CO2, all those sort of things, everyone should have a problem with, with Congress not setting policy with it being done unilaterally by regulatory groups. That smells a lot like yeah. politics and agendas, not like regulation. The things I do at the Railroad Commission, I don't do unilaterally. The legislature has granted me that authority and has charged me with that authority yeah. and reviews that in sunset, right. whether I'm doing that correctly. I think that's hugely Is important. there any kind of federal regulation that you think the Railroad Commission would be comfortable with? Well, we work today with federal regulators. In other words, where you see, where you see touch points and cross points, Department of Transportation and FEMSA on regulation of interstate versus intrastate pipelines. Yeah. Uh, and in general, we have good dialogue with those guys. And when they come down and ask us questions, look, Railroad Commission, you're the only agency in the country that has 800 people, 700 people who specialize in this, and we want to get your take, we want to have a good dialogue about effective regulation, then right. we want to work with them. So when your colleague on the commission Say, I mean, back to this question about a political agenda. So mm -hmm. your colleague, David Porter, on the commission talks about a radical environmentalist ideology masquerading as scientific fact. I think he could be a little bit more pointed in that quote than he was. Uh, uh, when Commissioner Porter says that, you, you agree that, generally speaking, that this is ideology rather than science driving the federal government's interaction with Texas? Typically, when we do get in the battles that you're asking about, that is exactly what's happening. Right. So we're seeing an, an agenda, a political agenda, being pushed via regulation from the feds, and we're simply saying, look, that's, that's not our agenda. When people, when people say, and I, give me, yeah. if I'm doing my job well, when I'm on my best day, the people of the state don't even know that I'm an elected official. They say, this guy's a, a geek, he's an engineer, he's out there doing the job. If it smells and feels and tastes like politics, then we're off base. And too much of the things right. that we're getting in battles with, yeah. the Fed's on, it absolutely reeks of political agendas. And by the way, that doesn't give anybody in the country confidence in what's being done, because yeah. it just seems like politics. You, you mentioned the CAFE standards. Is there another area in which you think the federal government is overstepped? from a political standpoint on trying to impose its view of the world on Texas? I didn't say that they overstepped on the CAFE standards. Well, you, you cited that. the CAFE standards as an example of the way that... Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, most recently we've also seen these steps on methane emissions, right? It's another area where yes. you have to beg the question, is this really based on scientific study or is it based on another agenda item? And it certainly seems like it's a hydrocarbon-based agenda item, it's does, it does really based on is this going to have a positive impact on the environment or on our economy or on the people of the United States? Right. Is there a conversation around climate? You also alluded to at one point uh, earlier today, uh, climate change, which is obviously a political football now and, sure. al now and always. Uh, is there a legitimate place for the Railroad Commission to be talking about the environment in a broad sense or climate in a specific sense as part of its responsibilities? Well, we talk about the environment at the Railroad Commission every day. Yeah. Because once again, I got 27 million Texans who want to make sure that, yeah, we, we like the fact that oil and gas is doing well. It's, yeah. it's benefited our economy, it's benefited our schools, our roads, everything else. But most of the people in that industry are hunters and they're fishermen and they're outdoorsmen. Right. And we want to make sure that we are keeping that outdoors, uh, let's say sovereign, that, that we, we protect it for not just our generation, but future generations. That's a big right. part of our charge. What about the climate uh, science or climate change conversations specifically? Well, you know, nothing has been so politicized, I think, in modern history as climate science. Look, these are the facts. The fact is the, the, the global temperatures are fluctuating up and down. It's been going on a long time. Everybody yeah. knows that. I'll also tell you this, and at the risk of making news, uh, everything on Earth has an impact on that. So does man, people will say, well, does mankind have an impact? Sure. So do cows and trees and right. uh, clouds and everything else. 
The question is, what degree of an impact do we have? And no one has answered that question quantitatively. Now, we say, oh, well, no, the IP, you know, C has come out and said this, this, yeah. that, and the other. I've read those studies, and there's some questions about how those models are done. Unfortunately, it's become so politicized, we can't have a real effective discussion about to what degree are mankind's activities have an impact. Is it minor? I mean, if you delete Ryan Sitton today, look, I'm a, I'm a you know, fast-talking politician. Yeah, that'd probably have a negligible positive impact on global warming. Right. Uh, do you think the government in this area has, as the again, back to citing uh, things that uh, Chairman Porter has said in the past, mm -hmm. uh, war on fossil fuel. Do you think that the government has it in for the fossil fuel industry? I will say this. I think it's very easy to pick on, let's say, oil and gas specifically, fossil fuels, right. to fuel, to, to fuel, mil um, to fuel a political agenda, to raise dollars. It's just too easy. I mean, it's low-hanging fruit. So you ask me, do I think that there are people in the country? Absolutely. I, I had a, a guy tell me one time who used to work for an environmental organization right. that says the, the biggest opponent to actually having real conversations on protecting the environment are environmental organizations because in order for them to raise money, there needs to be a war. If there's educated dialogue and good scientific discussion, no one yeah. writes checks. So yeah, I think absolutely there's a negative agenda out there that is not benefiting many people in the country, but it's helping to raise some dollars. Uh, you've been on the commission now for a year and a half, mm -hmm. right? You've served for a year and a half. So you probably have enough of a, of a sense of what your job is and is not, and what issues are and are not important to the commissioner, to you specifically as a commissioner. Tell me what you think about when you get up in the morning. What are the, what are the three or four things that you think the commission does that are most important to all of us? Well, I've said a couple times, I'll say it again, if yeah. I want the people of the state to be confident, then when I think about, when you get up in the morning, where are the areas where there's concerns are coming up? Either because there's events like seismicity, uh, there may be a specific discussion around a, 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 an area like Joe Pool Dam, which has yeah. gotten some recent, recent news. Uh, it may be areas just where activity is picked up, so we see truck traffic or we see new wells or new pipelines. Uh, I live in, my home is in Friendswood, Texas. I'm literally on the Friendswood oil field. Right. And so these are areas, well, okay, what do we need to be doing in those areas? Are our rules, have they been modernized to recognize what's evolved in the last 10 years, which has been the, the, the biggest right. leap forward in oil and gas development in a generation? Uh, do we communicate adequately with the public? And I think that's something that is a big challenge for us. When you got most of the people in the state don't really know that much about oil and gas, don't even know that the Railroad Commission regulates oil and gas activity, right. how are we communicating with those people so that they know we're right. on the job and when to call Well, us? if I come back to this question of the perception, whether it's the perception that you all have not done enough on seismicity or the perception that somehow the commission is, and this is obviously a broad caricature in the pocket of industry, that may be as much of a communication problem as it is a problem of the reality of the commission. I think it's absolutely. I, I think it's predominantly a communication problem. That, that is often the, 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 the pushback on that. Um, you're an engineer. I am. You are the, it is said that you are the first engineer in, to, 50, years. in 50 years on the commission. You know, we have a, 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 I don't want to pick on Glenn Hager, we have a controller who is effectively the CFO of the state who's not a CPA. We have had railroad commissioners for 50 years who are not engineers. Do we have a problem with people running for elective office to serve on all these regulatory agencies or to run in these statewide offices who ultimately have these backgrounds that don't seem like they feed into? It, should, should I be concerned that there hasn't been an engineer on the railroad commission in 50 years? Well, I think that that question is really not a question for me. It's a question for well, the Well, but I'm asking, I have you here. I'm asking right. you. Well, let me, t so I'm, I'm telling you, yeah. if, if that were a problem, yeah then I think the voters of the state would have said that that's a problem, yeah. right? If you look at the, the, the positive impact on the economy that we've had, when I say, I don't just mean railroad commission, but broadly the, right. the political environment, uh, you look at how, how well the state's done in general, the satisfaction with state politicians, that would seem to indicate the answer is no. Right. Now, in the today's world, I think, and people ask me all the time why I even run for the railroad commission in the first place, because right. of that technological advancement we've seen in the last 10 years, the, the rapid development, the rapid changes in industry, I think at this time it actually is, I do provide a, a specific value that I'm very, very pleased with and it's neat to be impactful in that way. Yeah. If things were kind of run and maintained, business as usual, wasn't a lot of changes, is it, is an engineer provide a whole lot of value? I don't know. I wasn't here at that time, but today right. I think we are. But today's not indicative of all time. So maybe the question is not whether the process of putting people on the commission is something we should rethink, but it's the commission itself. You know, Sunset has examined a couple times in recent memory the inner workings of 
The Railroad Commission, the last time Sunset put out, recently put out a, a pretty significant comprehensive report on, on wa the ways that the agency might be run differently. You responded by saying you thought there were some constructive recommendations sure. in there. Let me ask you about a couple of the big ones that have come up that might represent reforms uh, for the commission. The name change thing, that obviously is, we almost laugh about the fact that, oh, there's no trains at the Railroad Commission, but in fact, the name of the agency is to the average person, and we're a state full of mostly average people, not insiders, it's misleading. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just change the name? Why is, why is the name not changed to reflect the work of the agency? You ask me why I don't change the name, because I don't have the power to do right, it. Right, but I, don't mean, <laughs> I mean you and the Royals, should we not be changing the name of this agency per the sunset? Yes, I think we do. I think we should change the name. Yeah. And in fact, last time there was a bill, uh, Larry Phillips, state representative, yeah. uh, a bill to constitutionally change the name to, I think it was the Texas Energy Commission. I right. publicly support that. You have no problem idea. with that? No, I have no problem. Yeah. Uh, what about adding teeth, again, these are recommendations that came up in Sunset, the last uh, comprehensive report. Uh, add teeth to penalties for operators. Do you think that that's something that needs to happen? Uh, you know, you asked me today, what, what teeth do we already have? So. So you said, I want to give you, Ryan, and the, the other railroad commissioners, more flexibility to assess penalties in ways that we think are meaningful. Sure, as much flexibility as, as I can have is a good thing. Uh, today, I can pull an operator's P5 and essentially shut down their ability to operate. That's pretty strong teeth. Yeah. So uh, we have a lot of ability to enforce today. And once again, this gets to a communication issue. Ryan, how many P5s has the railroad commission pulled just since the beginning of the year? Well, it's been dozens. So yeah. we're, we're on the job, but this is not something the public's generally aware of. Uh, are there areas in, in cases where we could assess different fine structures and, and utilize enforcement or utilize fines, teeth, if you will, in, in a different way? Sure, and I like that flexibility to do those things and, and have flexibility to apply those in ways that we think may fit certain instances yeah. other, rather than G others. Giving you more latitude to penalize operators doesn't mean that you're going to penalize operators. Exactly. It just gives you the ability to do what you feel like you need to do yeah. situation by situation. Do you feel like you need more resources to plug abandoned wells? Again, that was something that the Sunset Commission Yes. Raised as an issue? Yes. Why don't you have that, uh, those resources? Well, our funding structure today, which has been very effective over the last, uh, in fact, for, for, since I think it was 2011 when they made the revision, is based predominantly on fees that come into the agency. Right. Uh, and in general, I, that model makes sense. In other words, we ought to have, yeah. government ought to function as much like business as we can. If, if the agency is really needed, shouldn't there be fees coming in from an industry to do that? The problem is some of the functions at the commission don't ebb and flow in the same direction as industry. Well, the flip side of that is, is that when the price of oil is over 100 bucks, as it was a couple of years ago, more money flows into the, uh, to the commission in the yep. form of these fees. When the price of oil is, as it was in January, at 29 bucks, less right. money flows into the agency. The question is, you really are dependent upon the health of the economy of the and industry. the health of the oil yeah. and the gas sector specifically to get the funding you need to do your job. Isn't that weird? Well, for part of it, it's not weird. For example, say yeah. permits, right? right? If no one's asking for permits, then I don't think I should spend the money on having a permit group, right? right. There are other areas, like you mentioned, plugging. The, our plugging needs don't fluctuate with the condition of the industry. In fact, to some degree, when the industry is down, that's when our needs to go out and handle abandoned wells is at its peak. So my request for the legislature during sunset is going to be, can we look at this model? I don't necessarily need more money, but can we change the funding model to make sure that the pieces that don't, that, that don't ebb and flow with industry are not also dependent on that, that revenue stream accordingly? And we'll yeah. see if the legislature uh, how they want to respond to that. I, I put a lot of faith in them. They've been very supportive of the, of the agency, and yep. we'll continue that dialogue. Uh, people associate the uh, Railroad Commission with the regulation of oil and gas, but in fact, you have a lot of responsibilities as we the do. commission that people don't necessarily know, and one of those is you have power over natural gas utilities. We do. Right? That actually came up in the course of this campaign when the candidate was asked if he knew that the commission was responsible for natural gas utilities, and he seemed not, not to know. You, you know that that's your responsibility. Wait, what? What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, uh, there's some question in the Sunset Report whether the commission should give up purview over mm -hmm. uh, natural gas utilities. What do you think about that? Well, if natural gas, if specifically it's the rate-making capacity that they're right. looking at, right? The Railroad Commission is the one that says, here's the rates that we allow the LDCs to, to charge. The reason it needs to stay with the Railroad Commission is not because, oh yes, we have a particular genius around financial modeling. Right. It is because when you look at, let's compare electricity lines versus pipelines. If electricity line begins to degrade, and even if the electricity line goes out of service and it falls down, it's hanging up there, it's not a particular safety issue in the high wires. 
a pipeline begins to degrade, now we're talking real safety issues in neighborhoods, and yeah. our personnel have expertise around evaluating pipelines, looking at should it be built out of you know, carbon steel, what sort of coating should be done, cathodic protection, inspection requirements. All of that capital investment has to be considered in the rate-making case. Yeah. So it's that expertise, which is why I don't think it should be moved out. Leverage our expertise to make sure when a company comes forward and says, we'd like these resources, to rebuild this pipeline infrastructure and pass it along to ratepayers, we have the ability to assess those risks and to make a good decision. Are there other reforms maybe that the Sunset Commission did not mention that you think would benefit the commission or benefit the state? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, again, you've only been on the commission for a year and a half. On the other hand, you've been on for a year and a half. Yeah. You have a sense of how this works. Yeah, I think that, uh, there's, first of all, let me speak to a couple things that they brought up that I thought were good ideas. Yeah. You know, for example, they talked about having a, a, a database that was easier for us to go back and look up repeat offenders, yep. more quickly assess if a guy is what one of our staff members called a frequent flyer uh, versus someone who has been a really good performer that has simply fallen out of compliance and we need to have more flexibility yep. work with them. Thought it was a great idea. That technology does not exist at the commission now? The, the data is there, but it's not easy to extract the data. So ha yeah. giving us some reporting functions that enable us to pull it out real time versus having to do some digging right. uh, and do it as a part of every case is what we're not doing. So it's a, it's a process yeah. question. Now keep in mind, I don't need the legislature to do anything for me to, to build that. It was just a good idea. So, you know what, we should do something about that. So yeah. there was good ideas in there. Uh, there's always today, because of the, the things that we need to advance that the Sunset Commission didn't talk about in, in specifics are, where there are rules that are just simply outdated. They fit, th those rules fit a time 20 and 30 years ago in the way the Commission operated right. that today we need, to, we need to update. We're talking about some right now on flaring. Uh, I was having a conversation uh, just recently on how we monitor skim oil off of, um, off of disposal oil processes. So things that, uh, even, even new standards that we have put in place that uh, were good but still need to be tweaked and evaluated. And those are, frankly, some of the biggest things that we have to look at because if, if our rules are really good, if they, if they recognize current methodologies and best practices, we can enforce them efficiently, we can communicate to the public more efficiently. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of those that we're going to be working on. I don't on. believe, Commissioner, this specific Sunset Report uh, made this recommendation, but I know that a previous one has suggested that possibly we should ban contributions to commissioners running for re-election from industry. I suspect there are some people in this room who would go, oh, my God, thank God, I can't give money. I would, I would do it, of course. <laughs> might save people in this room a fair amount of money. W what do you think about that? Again, this gets back to the perception mm -hmm. that somehow people with business before the commission are spending money to elect the people who would ultimately resolve, decide on that business before the commission. We hear this with judges, sure. you know, people who run for judicial seats. Do we want to ban contributions or limit contributions by people with cases before the court? Or do you want to say at the controller's office, we want to ban political contributions from people with contested cases before the controller's tax mm -hmm. authority function? What, what do you think about that? Well, in my year and a half in office and a year and a half running for office beforehand, I've never once had a donor ask me for anything specific to the commission. Not once. Would what you I tell do, me if you did? I would. You would? I would, yeah. Why not? Because, look, if somebody did ask me for that, what I would say is, I'm sorry, you can't donate to me anymore. And right. now I'm going I'm to have to recuse myself from that case. So you would probably already know about it if that right. happened. Uh, what I will tell you is this conversation about who benefits from us being a good regulator right. and industry being a beneficiary of that almost all the time it is, Ryan, we want to make sure our rules are good, we want to make sure you're enforcing them, and we want to make sure you're communicating with the public about it. Right. Who better to size up who's going to do that well, who is going to go after bad operators, who's going to make sure our rules are good, right. than people in industry? So you ask me, should they be allowed to do I think so, because they make us the best commissioner. Peep, and, and people are always going to make assumptions about cause and effect, mm -hmm. but as long as you maintain your integrity in the process... Sure. Well, once again, and if right. you assume for some reason that somebody is trying, oh, this guy's donating money because he wants special treatment, then you, you go to this sort of conflict right. of interest. But I will tell you, people who are trying to skirt the rules don't donate to railroad commissioners. They don't want to be on the radar screen, right? right? They want to be off to the side. So I think yeah. that assumption is a poor one to start from. Let me ask you about a couple of uh, 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 a little bit off-base th things here, not necessarily related to the commission's work. One question related to the commission. There's a perception on the street that you guys don't get along. Do, do the commissioners on the commission, the three of you, how is everything? Sometimes it seems like a reality show. 
Yeah. Real Housewives of the Railroad Commission. You know, you guys, uh, <laughs> you know, just when, when the cameras turned off, the fists start flying. You know, what, everything okay with you guys? Yeah, so I, I actually wish it was as exciting as everybody seems to think it is. Yeah. Uh, so you get yeah. on well with everybody? You and Commissioner Craddock are good? Yeah, well, you know, we don't You we don't and Commissioner talk. Porter are good? We don't talk very often because right. we, are, we are precluded from doing so by the yeah. rules, right? Um, now, do, do we agree on everything? Absolutely not. That's not the intent, right? We have three right. commissioners. The, for but the inter I guess I'm asking, I, I understood that. The, the yeah. inter anybody been in a marriage knows you don't get along on every subject every right. minute, right? right? The interpersonal dynamic, though, of the three commissioners on the commission, this is a properly functioning body. There's not a, we don't need to send in a, an old priest and a young priest or <laughs> you know, intervene somehow to get you guys to be on the same page. It's all good? Yeah, I, once again, wish it was as exciting as right. you, but yes, it's, we're in great shape. I really like right. the, the commission that we had today and I, like, right. I appreciate my colleagues. We have very different backgrounds. Yeah. I'm obviously not, a, not, not been in politics very long, pretty much a big dork. Uh, you've got Christy has been around uh, the, the political process for a long time, has a right. lot of knowledge there that would take me 10, 15 years to build up. Right. So, yeah, I think we're in good shape. Do you send Tiff's treats to Wayne Christian on runoff night? Uh, I Tiff's treats. I I texted him and said you congratulations. Did? Yeah, I called him the next day. He said congratulations. He was very nice. Uh, yeah. You know, I think once again, I wish it was as exciting as. Um, in fact, I was listening. I think to your last uh, trip cast. And you said, man, uh, Ryan. Wayne well, look, I mean, com 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 <laughs> this is going to be exciting. Com com <laughs> commissioner, you and Wayne Christian kind of went at it. Sure. In the last thing. So all's forgiven, all's forgotten, everything's great, you're gonna to work together fine, no problem. No drama. That's my expectation, and from what Wayne saw me, it's his too. I, I don't I really You guys are gonna be good. I think so. Okay. Let me uh, you're a statewide elected Republican who keeps his nose clean. <laughs> it is fashionable these days in my business to ask statewide elected Republicans who keep their noses clean about other statewide elected Republicans who may be in challenging circumstances. I don't know what you're talking about. I know you don't. You're about you're about to. Uh, you know that the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, has right now uh, uh, been indicted and has been accused of securities fraud by the feds. You know that the Ag Commissioner of Texas, uh, Sid Miller, is under investigation by the Texas Rangers for misuse of taxpayer funds. They m may both be entirely vindicated and onward we go. But it has been, as I say, commonplace in a situation like this to ask you if you'd like to say a word in support of one or both. You want to say a word in support of the Attorney General as all this goes along? Well, so let me, I'll speak to both of those. Yeah. Uh, at the commission, every time we've had a legal issue that I've had to engage the mm -hmm. attorney general, um, I can call him on his cell phone. He calls me right back. He brings his staff together. Yeah. He, he is extremely responsive and supportive. In his professional capacity, he's been nothing but great to work with. Yeah. I've enjoyed working with him. I think he's a great guy and a good man. And your perspective on his situation right now is it will work itself out, but you support him. In, 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 from his political in, job he's doing, I can't say anything other than he's doing a fantastic job from yeah. what I've seen. Now, his, his, his is not... His particular case isn't related to his job in office. These were private things that were being handled in the court system. Right. You know, the, the frustration for somebody like me is that's what the court system is supposed to do. And it's, it's frustrating not just for me, but disappointing. I, I really feel for Ken that he's constantly on yeah. trial in the public domain for something that the court system is supposed to work out. Yeah. You want so, to say a word of support about the Ag Commissioner? Do you want to support him? Well, look, no, I don't, I've never had to work with Sid on anything in our political environment. Every time I get to talk with Sid, I like him. He's a nice guy. Um, you know, these are, nobody's perfect. And I think, look, the state has trusted Republicans to be the statewide elected officials that run the state for nearly 25 years. And that carries with it a very high bar. And I'd be the first to tell you, I'm not perfect and I yeah. make mistakes, but uh, Sid is, himself has said these were mistakes and he's going to clean up. I take him at his word and I assume that it won't happen again because it doesn't reflect well on us as the people who have to be to some degree beyond reproach, even though we know we're going to make mistakes. We have to always try to be exceptionally right. clean in this stuff. So I, I, I'm hopeful he's going he's to clean that stuff up and won't make those mistakes again. All right. uh, on the subject of nobody's perfect, let me ask you about the presidential campaign. Uh, you were you were the statewide uh, you were a statewide co-chair of the uh, Cruz campaign. You were not only uh, for Senator Cruz, you were enthusiastically senator for Cruz. In fact, I think I heard you say you spoke at three different caucuses on Iowa caucus I did. night, running between the caucuses on his point. on his behalf. Uh, you campaigned hard. You were the chair of his energy task force. You were all in Cruz crew. That was it. Uh, as you know, Senator Cruz now with uh, Speaker Ryan yesterday coming out and saying that he will support. Um, uh, Mr. Trump is the Republican nominee. Uh, Senator Cruz is pretty much the last man, not the only one, but pretty much the most prominent person 
uh, who has not come around and supported uh, Donald Trump. And, and there have been some of his supporters in Texas who have said we're going to support Trump, but there are others, prominent supporters, who have said that they're not, not comfortable, not there yet. You got up at the Rep state Republican convention and, and gave what I thought was a hell of a, an interesting speech. You said that I intended to come talk to you about one thing, but I heard Dinesh D'Souza at the convention speak the night before. And Man, Evan, you actually watched my speech. Caused you to scrap your speech and to, and to make a different speech. And you basically said, I'm going to support Trump. I'm going to vote for our nominee. Interestingly, as you just did, you won't say his name. <laughs> say, his, say his name. What, is this like a force you well, thing? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to. I'm, 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 I don't like the pressure. Evan, I'm trying to. This, this is Look, what Donald you said. Donald Trump. I'm going to vote for Donald this Trump. This is what you said. The party is bigger than one man. I'm absolutely going to vote for our nominee, not because of the man he is today, but because of the president. I'm hopeful all of us can help him become. It, 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 the, the acrobatics involved in, that, in the construction of that sentence. You're like Nadia Comaneci doing gymnastics. I mean, I just, just come out and say, I support Donald Trump. I will vote for him. I mean, it was, it was extraordinary to, from the perspective of people who knew how supportive you were of Senator Cruz mm -hmm. that you actually kind of came out and said, nope, I'm going to do it. But it seemed like you were struggling with it. Can so you yeah, help us look, understand your Oh, yeah, no, no, there's no question. It, yeah. it has been a struggle. I said yeah. that on stage. Look, yeah. this has been an, a, a somewhat emotional thing for me yeah. to have to, to still be. I, Ted is such a smart guy. Yeah. He studies the politics. When we talked about energy, I mean, he sat there for two hours and asked questions. We had a dialogue about how energy policy right. affects the state, the United States. I mean, that it's, it's so special, in my opinion, to have somebody that, that engages at that level. Yeah. So, yeah, when, the, when Ted bowed out the night of the Indiana primary, I mean, it was very emotional for right. me. Uh, but you've gotten but, to a place where you're comfortable with the nominee. Yes. And let me say it this way. You've got two choices, right? One of two people is going to be the next president of the United States. Right. Uh, I know that this road, which, and in my opinion, the long-term negative, the long-term problems for our country are the fiscal yeah. Uh, overspending are absolutely out of control. And I know that Hillary Clinton's strategy is only going to make that worse. Mm -hmm. And bankruptcy is, is looming in, I, in, I think, a way that most of us are not really ready to talk about. Uh, my hope is Donald Trump will go a down a different road. Now, we just don't know a lot about Donald Trump today, yeah. right? Because the, he came out of nowhere, never been in politics. Uh, he, he espoused a lot of positions, but they're in a fairly inflammatory way, and so we want to know what, what's the intellect behind that. I've never had a chance to talk to the guy. So at this point, I say, these are my two choices. Given those two choices, this is the one that has the highest probability of going this down. This is right a road. vote against or a vote for? It's a vote for. It's a vote for. And as I said in that speech, look, when you step back and think about it, a lot of people have put a lot of time and energy into building this party and building this brand, building this infrastructure into right. what it is today. And it's a vote for that party and my hope that, as I said there, that, this, that Donald Trump is going to be the guy we need him to be. You're up for re-election when? In, well, campaign, I guess, was starting three-ish years, four years. I'm, so you've got a ways school. to go. You've, you've thought about what you want to do next. You know, the Railroad Commission, Ross has said famously that the Railroad Commission tends to be more of a leap pad than a lily pad. People get on the Railroad Commission and they immediately start raising money to run for something else. What are you going to, you know, you, you can rebut that sense right now by committing to run for re-election. Is it too late to announce my presidency for, my candidacy for president of the United States? Well, not, uh, it, not no. until they finally give him the I guess uh, there's a chance still, right? But yeah. no, what, 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 seriously, what are, you, what are you thinking about from your own perspective? Well, so I, you stand up here today and I say, of course, every, as every railroad commissioner would do, absolutely, I'm going to be a railroad commissioner. I'm going to run for railroad Forever, commission office. Right. Yeah, and, and that's what I'll say, Die too. Die on the commission. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me say this. I, I ran for railroad commission not because I wanted to be in politics, but because I wanted to work on energy policy. Yeah. which is intertwined with regulation very, very There tightly. aren't a lot of other jobs in government where you could do that. Absolutely if, if, not. If you're sincere about it, then that's you know, it. I spent right. 20 years of my career traveling the world, reading energy market reports, reading energy policy books. This is what I want to work on. So I consider it, so yes, I'm be a railroad commissioner forever. I think what's better is what I want to work on is the things I'm doing today. My full intent today is to run for re-election of the Railroad Commission. Now, that would be 12 years in office. Um, that's, a, that's a long time in office. There haven't been a whole lot of railroad commissioners who have served that long, right? I, not in recent history, yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's my, that is absolutely my plan, and I'm, I'm very comfortable saying that's what I want to do. Very good. Uh, we have a microphone in the back. We're going to bring you all into the conversation now, walk it around, give you an opportunity to ask questions. Please put your hand up, and we'll bring a microphone over to you. Sir in the front. Yeah. 
Uh, good morning. One of the interesting uh, suggestions that I saw in the Sunset Report, I think, was moving contested cases from the Railroad Commission to the State Office of Administrative Hearings. And uh, one of the, some of the pushback that I heard on that was that perhaps the administrative law judges at SOA uh, might not have the technical expertise to handle some of the admittedly complex cases of the Railroad Commission. Um, the Public Utility Commission has handed over contested cases to um, the State Office of Administrative Hearings. And that seems, I haven't heard any pushback that that is going poorly, right. and the electric industry is admittedly fairly complex as well. Uh, what would your thoughts be on that particular suggestion from the Good. Sunset? Well, yeah, what do you do with sure. contested cases? Good so, uh, first of all, just as a, as a point of history, and I'm going to get my dates wrong here, but the, this was done once before. Uh, the Sunset Review and the legislature resulted in moving the hearings over to SOA. It was so bumpy that they moved them back some short period later. If you ask me today, Ryan, can we move the hearings to SOA? Yeah, we could do that. Uh, here would be the impacts. At the point where you say these, these oil and gas cases are so complex, and we do have the staff, not just in our hearings division, but our oil and gas staff that can advise those hearing examiners when those cases come up. If you move these cases over to SOA, if I get those hearings examiners that aren't familiar with the cases, I'm going to have to add more staff to support those cases. The cases will become longer, and they'll become more expensive because of that nature. And then when the cases come back to me, and once because they weren't in my hearing division, they were at SOA, when they come back to me, I'm going to need more time to review them and to look at the key, because I, I won't, won't know, won't be familiar about what, with, with what's come out of that because the inability or the inefficiency, if you will, of these people that don't know the cases to prepare the information for us. So I'll need additional staff, additional time. So the cases will take longer and they'll be more expensive. And finally, this is probably the thing, though, that I think is most important. If you're an individual today that is part of a contested case and you go before the commission today, right? So you're, you're not an oil and gas company, you're an individual, and you come and you'll hear the hearings examiners ask the, um, the oil and gas company or whoever it is that's requesting the permit some very technical questions. They'll be sizing up the situation, uh, especially our technical examiners. I have heard from individual, what you call average citizens, who said, you know what, we, we went to the Railroad Commission and it was, we felt like we got a fair shake. Because the guys up there were, were not just impartial, they were, they were trying to make sure that they were confident in what they were doing. And these guys all knew the business. Uh, I think the public, especially those who are the quote-unquote average or unsophisticated yep. people, those are the ones that feel the best about getting that level of expertise on the dais. And that's why, that's the biggest reason. So if, they're, if you want to do away with that, make it more expensive, take more time, then we can move them. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh, give that information right. very, very plainly to the folks in the legislature. That's a recommendation you do not of the Sunset Commission. You do not agree with. I'm right. not, I, that's my takeaway. Questions for the commissioner? Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> no hands up. Gentleman over here. Yep. Uh, well, I just have to go back to the topic of climate change. Uh, the way you t discussed it kind of presented uh, uh, that there was uncertainty uh, in our need to constrain our emissions. And so I'd kind of like to go back to that. What is the source of justification for that thought, given that that thought is really only predominant in the political realm, not the science realm? Uh, so I'd like you to touch on that. And then the second part would be <laughs> benefits to Texas. I'm not a huge fan of the Clean Power Plan. I think it's better than doing nothing. Uh, I would much prefer to see the, uh, something come out of uh, the legis uh, of uh, Congress on this topic, but it's a little bit better than nothing. But it could have a huge positive potential impact on Texas. Most of the research I've seen on economic impact say that it will have a tremendous it will increase the value of natural gas relative to other fossil fuel products just because the energy to carbon content right. is higher. So, so, let's, so let's take those two, two uh, uh, first and then second, the question Eight million of cl dollars a year climate benefit. science and then the question of whether the clean power plan is better than nothing and there's an economic development benefit specifically. Sure. So let's take the climate discussion and specifically the target of the CO2 molecule, right? So forgive me, I'm going to geek out on you for a second. Uh, the whole, the, the principle of, of greenhouse, uh, of greenhouse gases and global warming is, okay, you've got radiation. You have three types of uh, heat transfer, convection, conduction, radiation. 
Radiation, if it goes straight from the planet's surface to basically infinite zero space, it's going to happen at a certain rate. If it hits a molecule on the way out, any type of molecule, it's going to slow down a little bit, and that inefficiency is what's causing global warming. And so people say, well, oh, that's where this idea of the CO2 molecule being this singular impact on global warming is what's driving all these, these temperature changes. Well, you know, on a cloudy day, the clouds have a, a exponentially bigger impact on the radiation rates of heat from the planet's surface out to, um, out to space versus a, a clear day. So this is why it drives this question, but how, what degree is it, are we really seeing? Uh, is, for example, the fact the planet's warming and there's more moisture in the atmosphere having a, as much an impact on its own as the CO2 molecule? And even if you said, well, Jiminy Christmas, CO2 is having some impact in there, if, if I said today I could remove every single CO2 molecule that the United States is emitting, uh, and I don't remember the exact dates, but something like eight years from now, India and China are going to more than make up for that in their emissions, not just in CO2 molecules, but in particulates in other areas. So the question becomes, if I go out there and say I'm going to shut down all the CO2 production in the United States, does it actually have any impact from a scientific basis or from a practical basis around the world? These are the questions we have to evaluate. Because at the end of the day, if, we're, if we think, well, let's, let's, even if you accept the fact, if you said, sure, CO2 is the cause, or whether it is or is not the cause, the fact is the planet is warming, and we ought to be talking about what to do about it, not whether or not, I, I could go over and put all my energy into CO2, and the planet still gets warmer, and if we haven't addressed what that means to us in terms of infrastructure, then we haven't done anybody a service. And these are, this is why I say this, these discussions are, are the ones we ought to be having, not getting so hung up on just the right. CO2 model. You, you, to the questioner's point, before you go further on that, you acknowledge that there is generally agreement with generally, agreement within the scientific community that is at odds with the perspective that you just laid out. I actually don't... don't don't know that that's true. Here, here's what I meant. Do I think that in general there is a, there's a group of scientific community that says CO2 is having some impact? Yes, I totally recognize that. Yeah. Where there isn't consistency is you, you can look at some groups of scientific studies and say it's having a marginal to negligible impact yeah. all the way to it is the singular impact. And there's a pretty wide range there. And that's the discussion we ought to be having. So you got an infinite zero space answer from the commissioner. Just so you know. <laughs> I don't know if you're expecting that. What about this question of the clean power plan and whether it's better than nothing? Obviously, it'd be better if Congress did it, but in the absence of that, there may be a benefit to Texas that we're not acknowledging. So, yeah, you talk about the economic benefits. Is it good for Texas for natural gas prices to be higher? Absolutely. Sure. Right? However, we have to ask ourselves the question in the interim. You know, today, if you look at the economic impacts of, of the clean power plan, and some people say, well, look, we're going to keep trending this direction regardless of whether the clean power plan was in place anyway because people are building more natural gas power plants because they're easier to start up and shut down, cheaper to maintain, cheaper to construct. Yes, while gas is at $2 a BTU. If gas, if you look at the, nat, the, the trends in pricing of natural gas, you say, well, what if gas was at 4 or $5 a BTU? All of a sudden, especially if it gets up to 6 $7, which it has been not that long ago, if the clean power plant comes to fruition and we build all these natural gas power plants, shut down all the coal-fired power plants, or the, the, the vast majority of them, you could see Texans paying twice as much for electricity. Now, you know, people may say, oh, I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's because, worth it. I, yeah, I that's worth it. Right. But once again, I'm concerned that we're having that discussion. You tell a guy today who's paying 200 250 bucks a month for his electricity bill in the summertime, he's got to pay 400 to 500 bucks a month. Yeah. That's a pretty ticked-off citizen. And I, that, there's a negative, there's a, certainly a negative right. economic impact from that. And that, so it's not as slam right. dunk as... So, so the issue here, just so we're clear, on this, this executive action or this administration as opposed to congressional plan, there, a discussion, do you oppose this because it came out of the administration as opposed to Congress, or do you oppose it on substantive grounds? It's both. Both. In this case, it's yes. both. Yes. However, if... Broad sweepingly across the country, people supported this, Congress support. I may still argue the scientific merits, the economic merits, right. but I couldn't argue with the process. Today, there's a, there's a massive process question right. that hangs out there uh, in addition to the economic. Let me questions. extend this just one second before we take. So acknowledge the possibility that you're going to get a Democrat in the White House. You may get Mr. Trump, but you may get Secretary Clinton in the White House. Sure. And the, so you're going to have now four years of a Democratic administration that in all likelihood is not going to be materially different than the administration that's been what? in on some, on some of these policies we've been discussing. 
What should the state's attitude be? You know, my, my sense, I don't know that this is shared in the legislature, but that in the last session, there was this idea that, well, we've got an election coming up in 2016. If, we're, uh, if we play our cards right, maybe we end up with a president we like better and an administration we like better. So we're going to slow our roll on a bunch of these issues that relate to our intersection with the federal government in hopes that we're betting right. If you bet wrong, you get into the 2017 legislative session, Hillary Clinton gets inaugurated on January 20th. What do you all do on some of these issues? If you've got a, what you perceive to be a hostile administration on some of these deals, what should the state's position be? Well, if I might just briefly put this into context, and I love this question, Evan. Let's imagine it wasn't about party. It was just, look, if you had a federal, yeah. uh, federal government that was doing certain things that were counter to the interest of the 27 million Texans who call this home, right. what do we do about it? What, what, do the, what do I think the voters of the state want us to do? Take care of business. And continue to push back? Sure. I mean, I don't, I don't just mean push back. I mean, push back is, is a, is a storyline. I'm saying take no, care no, of No, pushback is a line item in the Attorney General's budget, Commissioner. No, the, it, it I mean, is. The, the, we're looking potentially but at four not years it. of suing the federal government over things that we don't agree with, which is certainly our right to do. Absolutely. Right. But it doesn't stop there. Yeah. You know, for example, uh, regardless of who gets elected president, and once again, let's, let's assume for the sake of argument it's, it goes down the, the road you, you said, we have four more years of the same Mike, a, a don't, of don't, approach. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. But let's, if that were to be the case. What do I do as a railroad commissioner? I try to advance the, the, the same things I'm still talking about, make sure the people of this state are confident in how oil and gas develop. And then I look, how can our state be competitive both nationally and, ge and, and internationally in the energy space? That is what benefits our state. Yeah. For example, look at trade with Mexico. We do something like half a billion dollars a day of trade with Mexico, and a huge portion of that's in the oil and gas business. Yeah. So how can I help affect our state's economy by letting the people of, tech, of Mexico, the, the, the the leadership there know yeah. we want to we want to open this up and make sure that Texas is going to continue to benefit from these relationships. That's what yeah. I expect that the people of the state want us to do. Your candidate wins. Do you think we're still going to have that good trade relationship with Mexico? Uh, if it's in the interest of the state of Texas, I'm going to do everything I can to make is, sure. That is this goes. one of those areas in which you hope he's the president you want him to become? I hope that we continue to be a successful state for sure. Okay. We have uh, time for one uh, or maybe two more questions if somebody has their hand up. Uh, Ms. Barnett over here and then Mr. Keener will take, la no? Oh, Ms. Barnett over there. Yeah. Questions. Yes. So the first question is, you work many, many issues at the Railroad Commission. What keeps you awake at night? That's question number one. And then the second question is, where, what kind of agency would you like to see the Railroad Commission be at the beginning of your second term? Right. So that's a good, for the first question is a variation of what I asked you earlier about what are you thinking about when you wake up in the morning? I don't care if it's what keeps you up at night, but what is the biggest worry you have right now about the agency? Um, it, it is, and it seems so simplistic, but it, it, is, it is public awareness, public engagement, right? It's the fact that people don't know about us until there's a problem. You've you mentioned this a couple of times. Do you need me to suggest a publicist? I mean, <laughs> it, it's more than that, have right? Have you talked it's, about this with staff? Because this seems like something you can fix. It's bigger than staff. Yeah. You know, you, you, you mentioned name change, right? We yeah. talk about what, is it, what does it cost to go out and make a, a, a group of people that may or may not really care today to make them listen when they're only going to care when an issue happens, right? So there's a, it's, it's, it's not as simple as simply, we've got a great communications team at the Railroad Commission, but we're challenged with the fact that it's not what, people today are worried about getting their kids to school and you know, what their taxes are going to do and what their electricity bills are. They're not worried about oil and gas development until a pipeline comes through their neighborhood. Right. And so that's, that's the challenge that we have. And how do we, how do we engage the, the, the broader public in Texas in more discussions around energy policy? That's the thing that keeps me up at night, if you will. Uh, the second part is, and it, it ties into that, what kind of agency do I want us to become? One that is exceptionally publicly engaged. So, you know, if I, if I it's not just two years, because this doesn't solve overnight, but wouldn't you like to have a situation where when a, a city or a community or a homeowners association has a question, a concern, an issue, that they don't care about the politics, they call us yeah. and they say, hey, we know you guys are on the job. We'd like to talk to you about what's happening. And we're, we're not there yet. I think we're moving that direction. Um, once again, we've got a great communication team. We've got a new executive director uh, who's here today, and, um, and, and we're moving that direction. But it is, it's not an overnight fix, and it, that's the, yeah. that's the I, we'll be doing our, we'll be really doing our best when we're in that, in that role. Good. 
Let's stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, for your time. Glad we appreciate do. it. Please give him a hand. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. We'll see you in a couple of months. Thanks very much. <laughs>